up with the NBC Sports app and get closer. Additional camera angles, driver stats, and track information. You can watch live anywhere on any device. Find out more at NBCSports.com slash live as we see Denny Hamlin rolling once again. And Jamie McMurray jumps up to the top of the speed chart. 26-46 for McMurray. McMurray's run well here. He has a lot of good finishes here. And, uh, it wouldn't surprise me to run well against ball. So big change from qualifying setup to race setup as far as speed. These cars traveling about a second slower per lap in race trim. There you go. If you want to know what downforce is worth, there it is. Because that is fundamentally the largest change when it comes to qualifying. Is that that, that black area below the Chevrolet SS, that's the lower grid inlet. The air goes in there, goes through the radiator. It's required to run at a, at a, you know, a certain temperature. You have to allow air in. Well, for qualifying, you can cool the water down. You can tape that solid. That adds a ton of downforce. So I know no one likes aerodynamics. It's a dirty word. They think it's ruining racing. But the truth is, that's how valuable it is. That tape right there is worth about a second here at a one-mile track. And that's not new. No. There's no. nothing new about that. It was like that 15 years ago, 20 years ago. Big win yesterday for Alex Bowman winning the poll. His first ever Sprint Cup Series poll. Dale Hart Jr. was here to congratulate him when he climbed out of the car. The 23-year-old out of Tucson, Arizona. Home race for Alex Bowman. For the 8018, Greg Ives, all celebrating with Alex Scott out of the car. Dale Earnhardt Jr. I want to say something about that too. Dale Jr. being there to support the team. You know, that's his car. And that car just sat on the pole. And some, some drivers would feel that's a negative. Some drivers would feel, you know what, I want to drive the car when it's out on the pole. And feel bad about that. And, and actually messing your confidence a little bit. But Dale Jr. embraces it. He's glad to see his team have success. And that shows you that he's fully bought in. He's fully into making sure that when he gets back in this race car, that car is as good as it can be. And Dale Jr. is not too big of a person to say, hey, Alex Bowman did a really good job. What can I learn from that? What can I come back here next time and pay attention to what Alex Bowman did? That will make me better. But well, you see right there, Alex Bowman, is not in normal blue and white nationwide fires because he's running double duty. He's also driving Dale Jr.'s Xfinity car, the Junior Motorsports entry today. And, uh, you know, you always say, uh, does double duty help? But the last must be helping because he's a pole sitter. So, a uh, lot of good opportunity for this young man. And really, we're going to start to hear his name. Somewhere his name is going to come up around one of these rides. I know we had this conversation yesterday and, hey, what ride's available? I know it's complicated in the business of racing, but he's too talented, too well-spoken, too humble of a young man. In my opinion, the, the performance he's doing, this has got to move to the top of some people's list. And the key to Alex, in my eyes, isn't that he has, you know, he has a talent. We know he has a talent. It's getting him in a position to, to fail in regard to having a fast race car that can win races and, and make the wrong move late in the race. He, he's been with us for in this series for a long time, but never really in winning race cars, never in cars that could, you know, go to the front. Well, now he's in stuff that can run in the front. Right. That's what you have to have to be able to take that step and move forward is to make some mistakes with cars that can win races. Put yourself in that position. Well, and Alex Bowman is, is on the front row sitting, you know, on the pole for tomorrow's race. The 78 of Martin Truex Jr. Marty, they didn't even get a chance to qualify trying to repair this backup car to get it on the track. Did you find out uh, what, any more on the issue? A cool water temp, but pushing water didn't seem to add up. You can see him out on the racetrack. Steve heading back out to check in with uh, Cole Byrne and Jeff Curtis, the lead engineer on this race team, and they did say that they think it's a gauge issue inside the car. They they agreed that there was some ductwork issues with what was going to the radius, or air was not getting to the radiator, and they said water temperatures were over 300 in the 78 car, so obviously something was wrong with the gauge. So in the essence, in the, in the idea of getting some practice time here today, they're just going to send them out right now, but with temperatures over 300 seat, they're likely going to change this engine, but it won't be a penalty. They're already starting 40th on the field anyway, so they'll likely put a new engine in the 78 car for tomorrow's race just because that damage at 300 not worth the risk when you're already starting last anyway. Well, the issue you have is, you know, if the gauge wasn't working, was the ECU recording it correctly? Did they have any idea how long it ran at that temperature? You know, a lot of question marks and, and these engines aren't built with 
a ton of room for issues, right? They're built on the edge to make as much power as possible. And that's a long line of things that went wrong to lead into that, right? You had something blocking the radiator, and on top of that, you have a cage that isn't, isn't working. That's a, uh, that's, that's a perfect storm of events. The real, I'm sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. I was going to say the real question mark is, will NASCAR let them change it? You just can't change it on your own. Right? You're going to have to talk to NASCAR. And, and I've never really seen them dig their heels in and say no. I mean, he's pushed water. They could, you know, it's already been documented. They could, they could look at the, the the data that comes out. Yeah, as long as the data recorded it. Right. But if the data says 200, then, then yeah. I mean, you're back in the same place. Mike. Well, guys, catching up with another one of the Toyota teams, the one of uh, the 18 car you see right there, Kyle Busch, uh, has just made some adjustments to that race car. Uh, so far, he's been complaining a little bit that the car's been a little bit too tight and getting tighter progressively as he runs. Uh, one thing I felt was pretty interesting that he said over the radio was, and you really can't blame him when you think about it, he told the spotter, hey, make sure you really pay close attention to what Kevin Harvick is doing here in terms of the line he's taking around this racetrack. We need to study that. And we need to emulate that a little bit. And like I said, you can't blame him when you consider the record that Kevin Harvick has had here in Phoenix over the years, guys. Yeah, Mike, I, I think the, the majority of that studying of the line would happen in three and four. Well, he wanted to. Kevin always turns. It seems like he turns a little sooner and gets to, the, gets to the corner a little bit quicker. But as Kyle approaches turn three, we see Kevin an awful lot of time. What he'll end up doing is we'll see Kyle Bush. He goes to the bottom of the racetrack. But right here, this is the bottom for Kevin Harvick. The bottom is below that yellow line. He can have his left side below that yellow line. We, a lot of times we don't see it in practice, but we see it in the race. So as drivers start saying, okay, how do I how do I beat the guy that's been the best in a racetrack? They use every tool available to them. They use spotters. They go back and watch the races. They, they use dart fish to help look at qualifying. They use anything they can. And so understanding that he's probably the team to beat based on past history, what is he doing? Every single minute of the, t of the day he's on the racetrack, that's information all the drivers are going to want. Well, Kyle Busch, he's had some decent cars here, but he's really had some struggles on pit road. And, and it's not really with the pit stops themselves, but the positioning of the cars. You see right here, everything looks good on the right side. Well, when the jack handle goes to the left side, there has to be enough room between the wall and the car for the jack handle to work. There isn't. The poor jack man is struggling to get the car up so they can change tires. You know, that is basically a positioning issue. Then here, 18 and Kyle Busch is close to the line. I think he tried to put it in reverse. Maybe had it in first gear. It rolled forward. This is another great shot of it. He comes in, he stops, and it's close, but I think he's okay. But then watch the rear tire. Right here, it drives forward just a bit. I think he meant it to be in reverse. Over the line, cost the picture time as well. And that was pit stall 18. He's in pit stall 22 for tomorrow's race and that is about where you see the 25 car that will be the, the pit stall for kyle bush as we see people watching this practice from the top of the mountains on horseback mark trex jr now fastest in this practice five lap average